Um, you know, when uh, uh, the securities laws were initially adopted in um, 1933 and 34, everybody said uh, disclosure is um, uh, and sunlight is a great disinfectant, and uh, disclosure is always a terrific approach. What's happened, though, is that most uh, people who are regulated and those who advise them uh, view regulations as simply figuring out how to minimize their liability as opposed to how do you inform people about what it is they really need to know, and the whole approach um, of disclosure, uh, e even uh, today, uh, which is largely backward looking. We tell people um, what the past experience has been of a company or an instrument, how it's been devised, and then we say, of course, it's no guide to future uh, performance and so on. We don't tell people, here's what you're buying, here are the risks that are entailed in this, um, and uh, here's what you really absolutely have to know to make a fair assessment of it. Um, and if you want more, um, you can dig down, uh, because we now have the technology to provide that kind of disclosure, um, so that people get the essentials and then can go digging for more. But we don't have a, 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 a true disclosure system anymore. We have a liability avoidance system, and that's um, uh, throughout every part of the regulatory system, and that is an unfortunate result of um, uh, the process we've all observed. There's, a, there's also, I, I don't want to prolong this, it's just one comment, but there, there's also some literature that too much information is, is, yes. is bad. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I studied uh, the, because uh, I was interested in it, the bankruptcy examiner's reports on Enron, and some of the, just the diagrams alone look mm -hmm. like uh, the diagrams of supercomputer chips. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't follow the, the, the round things and the square things and the triangle. I and mean, it's just unbelievably complicated. And one wonders if all of that had been disclosed, whether anybody could have made any sense of it anyway. So I, I'm not sure. Yeah, the, anyway. the, the, the key word is more is sometimes less. And that, that's a real problem mm -hmm. in the disclosure area. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is, perhaps more tailored towards Mr. Wall and Mr. Pitt. Um, in the discussion of the either super regulator or uh, goals-based regulator, it seems like it's you know trying to catch what slips through the fingers of the government governmental fist. And assuming that it's sort of impersonal and organic, instead of, you know, gee, well, I wonder why people keep slipping around, but the, you know, the market is an amalgamation of individual choices. Do you think that the fact that, you know, the parts that were not regulated by the SEC at Goldman, like you mentioned, or these things, the reason why they weren't is because people were specifically taking private actions to avoid regulation as a transaction cost and we're trying to sort of shunt around some of these things. And so every time we create a super regulator or a goals-based regulator, people just sort of are gonna look for a way to circumvent that. Yeah. Okay. I, was, I was just gonna say, um, uh, my, my view isn't um, uh, that having a super regulator will solve these problems. My, my difficulty is um, uh, twofold. One is things get lost in the cracks because of either um, uh, over coverage or under coverage generally in the system. I, I agree completely with uh, uh, Steve Wallman on that. Um, uh, but also, second, that in government, uh, what's really amazing is that often the left hand uh, doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And it can come up in the most bizarre ways. Uh, early on in my tenure, we got a uh, case in which uh, we were going to bring an enforcement action against a major bank. And uh, the case was well thought out on the staff's part. There's no question that we should bring it. Um, but I said, I want to call Alan Greenspan before we bring it, just so he knows it's coming. And if he has anything he thinks we should know, I at least can hear that before um, uh, we go forward with this action. One of the reasons why having a so-called Uber regulator might make sense is you would hope that within that kind of framework um, uh, you'd get more coordination. But it doesn't, that's not a requirement. You could do this with separate agencies, um, but you can't do it uh, where there are turf wars uh, between agencies, and we have seen that uh, throughout the history of regulation in this country. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. We're going to we're going to break at exactly 4:15 so that everybody has ample opportunity to uh, to get a seat and uh, for uh, Mark Levin's uh, talk. So, just yes, sir. Uh, presumably, in the absence of uh, purposive financial regulation, uh, the types of interactions that we're talking about regulating here would be governed by contract law, tort law, property law, uh, and uh, private ordering. And so I guess I just have a simple question. Uh, what evidence is there that the existence of purposive uh, financial regulation uh, tends to yield better results than the absence of uh, purposive financial regulation? Sounds like a professor. Well, uh, I would say that. the silence on the That's panel might be an answer to your question. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure it's easy to analyze that question because you're looking at a, uh, a, a you know, a, a, a counterfactual. That is, financial services has always been heavily regulated, especially banks, so we don't have very much evidence. There is some evidence on the Scottish free banking uh, era when there was no central bank in Scotland, no bank regulation, and as your question kind of uh, suggests, um, the Scottish banks during that period did very well, in fact. They were just as safe, just as solvent, just as you know, honest as banks in England, where, which were governed by the Bank of England. It's also true in, in uh, I, I mean, this is my, you know yeah. better than I do, but, but it, it seems to me that the least regulated, hardly regulated at all, group of entities uh, in, in the financial area that, uh, uh, that went through this crisis weathered the crisis better than any others, and I'm talking about the hedge funds. That's exactly right, and I also yeah. think that this yeah. is something we ought to take into account when we think about regulatory structure, because while it's true that there are significant risks of having non-regulated entities associated with regulated entities, there's also some benefit to regulatory avoidance in the sense that it frees the entrepreneurial you know, activities, it frees the entrepreneurial spirit so people can come up with new ways of doing things. So I think it's very difficult. Uh, but your question is a very deep question that bothers me as someone who studies financial institutions regulation, which is, you know, are we better off doing it this way, or if we just let market and contract uh, principles work, would that, you know, be just as good? I, I mean, I, I thought the answer is you might get might be a little bit different, so let me give a different answer. Uh, I think the, the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, we have an existing experiment that's been running in this country now for uh, the better part of a century, which is if you want to offer securities, for example, and you don't want to be subject to SEC regulation, you can. It's called a private placement. It's not a big deal. People do it all the time. And you can go out there and you can separately contract. You can go to venture capitalists, you can go to hedge funds, you can go to other people who are happy to buy securities that are not publicly offered, not subject to SEC regulation, not subject to the panoply of rules that require you to <coughs> do various things and file prospectuses, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do that. Uh, the cost of capital is generally a lot higher, though, in most cases, with regard to those kinds of privately offered securities. And as a result, people generally, if they can access the public markets because of the efficiency, do so. And so we've got an experiment with regard to that, and it's an ongoing and continuing one. And people can opt out at various times. Uh, some folks who can't access the public markets, smaller companies who are only able to get VC money, for example, are subject to and limited to that kind of capital. Uh, but if you can get to the public markets, if you're large enough to do it, you make a decision whether or not that's less expensive capital than not being in the public markets. And I think you can tell from the number of companies that prefer to go public and the number of companies that actually access the public markets on a consistent basis that there is a benefit to being in a regulated public marketplace. And so we have that today. This is not a, a, a deep academic exercise that requires a lot of other thought. Uh, people are able to make that private choice today, and they do so. And in many cases, people find the efficiency of a regulated marketplace to be far better than the inefficiency of everybody having to do private contracting.